maybe Thank you. Uh, is a, well, she does so many things. She's an accomplished graphic designer. She's a design thinker, a design strategist, a communicator. You've been teaching at UTS and elsewhere. Uh, you have careers in, I read, in New York and San Francisco and in Sydney. This is cool. I don't have that. Um, <laughs> So a wealth of experience in the room. So make sure you, you tap into it, you, you take advantage of that and, and learn something today. So I'm going to start the recording there. And okay. You are, you are on. Okay, great. So today um, I'm going to talk about how to create engaging communi visual communications. Um, and just to go over what I'll cover today, um, I'll start with what is visual communications? Why is it important? Uh, then I'll take you through the process um, and give you the the building blocks or components to work with um, to create communications. Um, I'll give you some tips um, and some guidelines, show you some examples along the way. And hopefully by the end of um, this, you'll have a better understanding of um, how to use visual communications. Um, and that's in whether that's in your assignments um, at uni or you know, if you create a, a new business um, or in the boardroom giving a presentation. So let's start with um, what is visual communications? So I've uh, given it this definition, uh, which is visual communications, the effective communication of messages using design to engage an audience. Now we're surrounded by visual communications every day, from the signs that we see um, to websites that we browse, um, apps on our mobile devices. Um, we might go and see an exhibition, see videos online. Um, and it even goes down to um, experiences and, and services um, that we come in contact with. And all of these things are purposely sort of designed. Um, and, um, and we can use um, um, visual communications to more effectively communicate. Um, so these days, we're inundated with information 24-7. And um, it's become um, more and more important to um, get your message across um, effectively. And visual communications is a really powerful way of doing that. Okay. So um, let's rewind a little bit um, in history to understand um, visual communications from a, a behavioral science point of view. So humans are visually wired. 70% of our sensory receptors are in our eyes. Um, and from um, the earliest of times, uh, we use our um, sensory organs to, to hunt and to mate, two sort of major human instincts. Um, and it's interesting to note that one of the first forms of communication were in forms of you know, images. So from cave paintings to hieroglyphics, to oracle bone drawings um, um, in China, um, which later developed into language. So 50% of our brain is used in visual processing, and the brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text alone. And we can get a visual scene in less than one tenth of a second. So shall we test this out? Okay. Did everyone understand that? Okay, so let's go back to that slide, um, which is a stop sign. And as you can see, um, it's in two different languages. We didn't actually need to, to read the words, actually. Um, but uh, the combination of the color red and the shape um, conveyed this message. And that's through um, um, being associated with the word stop that we see so over um, uh, repeated exposure, we begin to understand um, a symbol and it starts to um, um, have meaning um, and values. So this is a, a, a good sort of quote by Howard Gardner, the psychologist, who says, our memories retain such symbols long past the point that we have classified their intended meanings. Symbols are the building blocks of reason and memory. Now this is... Um, an example of the, the symbols that we see around us. And we all understand what these mean, right? Um, what's interesting to note is that these uh, symbols are often um, used in emergency situations. And that says something about um, the power of visual communications 
uh, being able to cut through a very noisy scene very fast, um, very quickly. And now that kind of philosophy has been taken into brands. Um, and so only natural that um, brands use logos and identities to convey their values and their ethos because it can cut through um, uh, noisy scenes very fast. Um. So on this um, page um, are some sort of cut-off logos, and I'm just wondering if um, anyone can tell me what um, these are. Top left? Top right? Bottom left? Toyota. Okay. So this is really interesting to note. Um, we, one, we understand these symbols, and two, even when more than half of the symbol is cut off, we recognise these symbols. Now, I actually tested this out with uh, third graders, eight-year-olds, and um, they got nine out of nine correct. Um, so this just goes to show you the power of symbols being able to cut through um, all ages um, and also cultures. Okay, so um, Harvard did a study on what makes visualization memorable. And they found that attributes like color um, and human recognizable objects are more memorable than less intuitive results such as uh, graphs, um, the common sort of graph. Um, and so my message here today is make it human. So make it something recognizable someone can relate to. This is a, a good example of, of that. Now Chinese is one of the most difficult languages uh, with over 47,000 different characters. And um, if you've ever tried to learn the language, you'll know how difficult it, it is. Um, and many people have struggled um, over the centuries to learn the language. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, just recently, a Taiwanese entrepreneur has created this system called Chinesey. Uh, which um, pairs sort of visual symbology with the characters, um, sort of so um, working on that same principle of um, memorability. Um, and these are the, the radical um, characters that are used um, over and over again in, in the language. And, um, and you can see um, as they get more complicated, um, you can see the pairings of characters. And I think this is quite ingenious. So the br human brain is wired to notice difference. Um, and it's a uh, phenomenon called pre-attentive processing. And it occurs in the low-level um, systems of the brain. And essentially, um, it is the, the visual cues that um, we can rapidly process, uh, that way our brains are wi you know, wired to rapidly process. Um, and scientists have defined um, 18 of these different cues. Um, and um, previously you saw color as one, uh, line orientation, curvature, density, things like um, motion. Um, so these things are interesting to sort of keep in mind um, when we're looking at um, creating distinct visual communications is what um, cues sort of catch the eye. Uh, so data visualization and visual storytelling um, is a very popular tool now um, because it works on um, this level of um, um, being able to uh, see information fast. And uh, as you know, uh, examples like uh, when we're browsing online um, in our social media, if we see a, a photo on our Facebook, we're more likely to, to read that. Um, and the same with um, data visualization and inf infographics, they get shared very rapidly because of that reason. Um, and so what it's very good at doing is um, making complex information simple, making the, uh, the abstract concrete, and illuminating patterns in complex data. So I'm going to show you uh, this example. Let's hope it goes there. Uh, so this is a, a site by Reuters, um, uh, which basically shows the social power structures of uh, the Chinese political system. Um, and now this is really interesting. This is a good example of 
making um, the invisible visible um, and showing the relationships. So here um, on the top we have um, these past and current leaders and you can see using the key that the, uh, the coloured stars are the ones of the current leaders, the outline stars are previous ones and if you click on any one of these it shows the relationships um, with uh, the princelings who are the, the offspring of these elite and also the relatives of the elite and you can click on any one of these and start to look at their, how their, their relationships. Okay, so how do I get back again, Jochen? <laughs> okay. Um, here's another example of, um, which is quite relevant to your projects, uh, which is cities. Um, and sort of m being able to visually map um, something very quickly. Uh, so Cities in Motion is a site uh, which looks at about 135 cities, um, um, mapping them against 10 different indexes uh, here, such as governance, um, I think um, human capital, etc. And it's very hard to see, but this is a, a bit, a, it's a spider web. Um, and from the middle it's uh, 0 to 100. So you can very quickly see um, which city is doing really well um, just by this very quick visualisation. OK, so let's get started on the process. Um, and the first step is really um, gathering and discovering, um, basically uh, gathering information and research. And one of the first things that uh, we do in any project is really listen ask and observe. And we want to know everything uh, about uh, the project and um, basically immerse ourselves. Now some um, good questions to, to ask with any uh, visual communication is who, what, why and where. So who is the audience? Basically who are we speaking to and who do we want to reach? Um, are they um, academics? Are they Gen Yers? Uh, are they government officials, um, etc.? Um, and in this case, um, Jochen. <laughs> so get to know your user. <laughs> um, what? So what is the end objective? Like, what are we trying to achieve with this piece of communication? Um, do we want to be seen as a thought leader, um, or um, do we want to s sell uh, something? Why are we um, doing this? So what is the purpose? Um, are we trying to um, educate um, or are we um, trying to um, engage? Uh, now where will it be viewed? Now this is uh, important. So is it going to be a poster or is it going to be an interactive piece? And this is Im important. So for example, I think you've been set an assignment which is a poster, an A1 poster. Um, so you need to think about how far away someone might stand from this poster, like approximately a metre away, um, and think about, um, you know, that might come into play with how big your, your text is and what you see from that distance. Okay, so with um, our research, uh, we're looking for uh, credible information. And there's generally two types of uh, research, quantitative and qualitative. And um, most likely, I think that you'll probably be doing a lot of quantitative data, which is really uh, more sort of uh, mathematical equations and statistics that you'll find. Um, and qualitative is pretty much um, observing, interviewing, and um, techniques to find out and understand the behaviours of people. So. Now you can gather as much information as you like um, and when we get to this stage of synthesis it's really about what to keep in and what to keep out. Um, and I like this quote, data without meaningful analysis and interpretation is generally useless. So this stage is really about connecting the, the dots in your data. 
and synthesizing the information to allow key themes to emerge. We want to define what the key message is, um, decide what's in and out, and really find what is the compelling story that you want to tell in all this data. And this applies to any communications. So I've just covered that. Uh, so this is uh, just a technique that might come in useful because I know that you're working in teams, is that right? Um, and what we often do is share information in groups and we usually do this with qualitative uh, data. Um, and basically um, what we do is uh, put sort of one thought or idea uh, per post-it note um, and once everyone is shared you can start to to see sort of um, groups of like information and group them into clusters. And once you've sort of done that, um, you can start to give them themes or names. And this is um, a really good method because it just allows you to see where the holes are. If you're missing any um, important pieces of information. And, and by clustering into groups, you can start to see if there's one main theme that really um, springs out uh, or and also you can start to think of these a bit like chapters in a in a story and like what are the components that are going to make up this story and I'm going to use an example from last year's uh, students and um, and how they sort of uh, clustered the information now you can actually um, show a lot of different facts um, for example, there might be about how many, 20, 30 facts here. Um, but what helps this is the hierarchy of information here. So our first read at the top is Melbourne, um, and um, the second is these pieces. I'm not sure if you can actually read them. It's a bit difficult. But these are the sort of subcategories um, which tell you a bit about the the poster. So an innovative city, a visited city, a connected city, a knowledge city. And so if you think about this and you're looking at a poster and you're walking by, what are the first things that you see? The title and what might help here is actually um, a sort of subtitle line um, or an opening paragraph. Um, and then the second read is these uh, subtitles. And then um, if you're really interested, you might go in and really explore that data. Now, this is a, another example um, of categories um, that they've used, which is innovation, administration, culture, environment, education, um, forming a sort of uh, a globe or cluster, um, a global city. So this is a really good exercise uh, to do, which is ask what are the words, adjectives and values that best describe the city? For example, innovative, green, um, urban, etc. And what are the unique characteristics of the city? So what makes this city different and what's really compelling about the city? And if you were to encapsulate the city in five words or less, what would it be? And I've just given this example of Tel Aviv, which is a hub of, uh, for technology and research. And it's often um, called Silicon Wadi, uh, the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. So once we sort of synthesize that information and we, we know what our, our key message is, we want to start to brainstorm ideas on how we might visualize that. And um, a good exercise to do is to brainstorm a few different ways that you might do this in about 10 minutes. Um, and don't be too attached to this at this stage. Um, have, you know, play around and you, know, you can um, eventually choose the one that you want to go with. But this is a, a place to sort of test out ideas and how they might work. So for example, um, Tel Aviv, for example, might be a, a hub. Um, we might want to have an image in the center uh, with information coming out from that. 
So think of this as the sort of big picture idea and what holds, holds the information together. So we want to think about it holistically um, and not about each piece of information, but we want to look at it as the whole. Um, for example, uh, do we want to take people through a linear story about the, um, the city? Um, might it be divided into four different parts um, or you know, be presented as sort of building blocks, etc. So you get the idea. Uh, so this is uh, just an example of uh, a poster, human storage. And you can see the, the big idea here is that everything that uh, people uh, consume, all these facts are going to go inside the human form. This is another example of startups in Sydney uh, by Blue Chili, and they've made an analogy to a rail network, so a network. So this, you know, showing the idea. So look for analogies that you can make that will help to tell the story. Uh, this is another one, the evolution of digital advertising, which uh, uses the uh, an analog pipeline to illustrate this. And if we think back to those visual cues that we were talking about earlier that catch your attention, and one of them is color and what jumps out. So they've used this blue pipeline, which is the very first thing that you, you really see that helps to navigate the reader through the information in a chronological order. Um, once again, this is um, a very sort of strong sort of piece that helps you to navigate through information very clearly. So once we've chosen um, one of those directions to go with, um, we can start to add in more detail. And this can still be done as a sketch or it can be done on the computer, but it's essentially mapping out uh, the information uh, so that you can see. And it's good to keep this in black and white, so we're just looking at um, uh, the information and you can see here that the grayed out bits are where the the illustrations places for illustrations are okay so now it's time to implement and I'm going to go through the building blocks or the components of uh, design and these are the more the, the formal elements of design and they're made up of things like the grid, fonts and typography, hierarchy, imagery, colours, tone of voice, space, balance and form. So let's go through each of these. Starting with the grid, because the grid is the foundation of design, uh, any design. So if you think about a city, um, most cities are are planned and um, use some kind of structure on which they're based. This is a city in Malta, uh, which is sticks pretty uh, strictly to a grid. And if we were to look at Sydney, it'd be uh, much more organic. And so with design, we use uh, grids to help us structure information. Now you can see here that uh, this is um, this shows like one columns. Uh, two column, three column, four column, to six column, and you can have up to you know twelve columns, even. And what's interesting to note is that the th top three have uh, some body copy text. And why this is important is you can see the length, the line length of the the body copy text here. And for example, if we're working with an A1 poster, now if we were to choose a one column, we would be reading like so. Um, what we want to avoid is making it difficult for the reader. So we want to avoid a line length that's too short, for example, you know, three words to a line, which just gets really annoying, and um, a line length that is way too long. Um, what we want to aim for is quick digestible information um, at a width that is easily absorbed. So this is where it's um, important. So for an A1 poster, we're most likely to be around the four to eight column grid range. Uh, so this just shows a, a website and 
the grid that overlays it. And once again, another poster. And this is a, a four column grid. So fonts and typography are another major component to work with. And I like to think of fonts kind of a bit like people um, and the clothes that they wear and the character that they have. And each font has uh, a different kind of character. So for example, uh, this sans serif font here, like Helvetica, is very classic. Um, it's very neutral, modern, um, can be used in most cases. Um, this one is, is more casual. Uh, this is a elegant and refined kind of typeface. So as you can see, fonts help to express a message. And uh, here's just another example of some more typefaces and, and the voice, different voices that they have. So um, something more rounded can be more user friendly. Uh, something that is very condensed can feel uh, quite sort of uh, conservative or authoritative. Something um, that is round is quite friendly. Um, and it's interesting to note that each of these fonts uh, will take up a different amount of room. So something that is has very round O's uh, will take up more space than something that is slightly condensed. Um, and as an example, uh, say for a newspaper where we want to get a, a very a lot of words in, we we'll probably use something that has is slightly condensed, but not uh, as condensed as this. So fonts are broken up into generally five different categories. And there are thousands of fonts out there. Um, but this helps you to sort of navigate um, the fonts out there. So essentially, the two main categories are serif and sans serif. Um, and serif denotes faces which have those little flourishes and feet at the bottom of them. And sans uh, without those, that comes from a French, the French word. Uh, so usually serif faces have uh, lots of thicks and thins in the typeface, and sans are much more even. So it's interesting to note that serifs are often used um, because they're easy to read, especially in, in printed material, um, fiction books, newspapers, etc. But sans serifs are, are more modern, and and you'll, you'll, you'll sort of notice that online and on websites that sans serifs are generally more easy to read, and that's because of the pixels and uh, uh, the, the resolution of making sans serifs easier to read. Then we have slab serifs, which is something in between a serif and a sans serif. As you can see, that the, the form of these have, is very even, but it also has these feet. So it's, all of these can be used as body copy text. And then we have a fourth category, which is display, which pretty much denotes every other kind of typeface out there. Um, and then we have script, which are the cursives. So within each of those categories, we also have fonts that have different sort of characteristics. So for example, our sans, if we look at our sans, that, um, and they have certain names. So for example, geometric sans, and it denotes very rounded um, shapes. So usually the O's are very round and all those letter forms are very round. Uh, humanist um, has a little bit more character there and grotesque has some thicks and thins. So each of these has a different character um, which can be added to your, your message. Um, so this is The other things that are uh, basics to, to know about working with typography, and they are generally letting, which is the, the space between the lines. And as you can see, uh, this one feels much more open and this one more dense. Tracking is really the space between each of the words. And so you can get a sort of different effect. And uh, when you look back on this, uh, what's good to do is standing back and you can see the different sort of uh, levels of gray on the page. 
So my tips here are to stick with one or two different fonts. So keep it simple or use a, a family of, of fonts that sort of worked well together. Now when we're using two or more different fonts, what we want to look for is contrast. So, uh, so looking for a pair that work well together and not two that are too similar. And the other tip is to be consistent. So I'm going to show you an example. Um, so this is some signs for uh, canine c commandments for a cathedral in the UK. And this um, is having a little bit of fun. It has a bit of humour to this, taking some um, reference to sort of biblical text, thou shalt not poop, um, and hold close thy Lord. And as you can see, this uses two, two fonts. Um, as you can see, uh, looking for contrast between those. Uh, this is another example of uh, a very strong typeface. Uh, this is for Oz Harvest, uh, which is a social enterprise that uh, collects food from restaurants and um, delivers them to the homeless. And this is a really strong identity because of the simplicity. So if you notice, uh, they've used really one main font in different um, weights and stuck to one color. Um, and with effective communications, what we, we want to do is really stand out and differentiate. Um, and by keeping it simple um, and being very selective, uh, with our choices, uh, we can uh, do that. So hierarchy. So we talked a little bit about hierarchy earlier, and it's essentially what stands out um, and what levels of read that you see first. Um, and these are just some general sort of components, headline, Subtitle, and as you can see, each is bigger or uh, than the next. And from a distance, uh, you'll be able to read some of those levels of information. So anything important, so which is your key message, you want to make that your first read, and whether that is images or text. So this is a an example of hierarchy, good hierarchy. Um, so actually the first read is pretty much that uh, organization's logo, British Red Cross. And the image uh, pretty much captivates um, our, our attention, so that has pretty strong hierarchy with this first line that leads our eye in, um, and this being a lower level of read. Uh, this is another example of an infographic uh, with the title, The Art of Car Buying, being your first read, and uh, this divided up into different uh, subsections that you, you'll read first. And as you can see, that the, the data inside each of these elements is smaller uh, generally than the next read. Um, that, so that's something to keep in, in mind as you're doing this, because uh, it's very easy to make some of these elements bigger. For example, uh, these numbers um, you might note uh, are at a smaller level. So really sort of working on getting um, the reader in by the, the very the first message, uh, then the second, and once you're in, exploring that detail. Now this example I put in um, because I thought that the hierarchy was a little bit, um, was not so great, uh, because the title doesn't really stand out and, and this particular piece sort of jumps out more than the rest. And, uh, and also, we spoke about um, using sort of graphs as opposed to things that are more humanly recognisable. Um, and so in going for s some things that are more human rec humanly recognisable will uh, get you in a bit quicker. And you can see that these, these main sort of heads um, are getting a bit lost there. 
So let's look at imagery. So with our imagery, we want to sort of decide um, what are the best methods of conveying your information. Um, and this can be through either some like pie charts or graphs or sort of more human recognizable objects. And we want to choose um, a, a sort of style of illustration and stick to it. So uh, my tip here is to keep it simple and be consistent. Uh, here's an example of that. This infographic is about energy use. And as you can see, the illustration style is, um, is an outlined um, black and white form used consistently throughout. And this is quite clever because it allows you to see this, the, the light, um, which is um, the yellow inside each of those illustrations. Um, this is very strong because, uh, as you can see, they're stuck to um, generally one font or two. They've kept the color palette very simple and distinct as well. So that goes back to keep it consistent. Here's another example of imagery, and this one actually uses two different types of imagery in here. One, um, which is on the top layer of uh, icons, and the second being the photography underneath. And as you can see, this is another good example of uh, keeping it simple um, with that typeface always in the white um, and the line drawings over the top, creating a, a, a distinct language. I'll put this one in because I thought that this one um, was a nice uh, representation of an annual uh, salary survey. So this uses the analogy of making, making your bread um, and using staples to represent this data. Um, and this makes uh, this information much more exciting and fun. That's the other thing, have some fun. Uh, this is an example um, using the headdress for showing percentages. Um, so this is a a tool that you can use also to, um, we often call this an inspiration board or a mood board, um, where you can collect um, sort of examples of uh, the illustration style that you're going to use, uh, sometimes with the uh, examples of the typography. And this one was for a sound studio called the Sound Brewery. Uh, so it referenced uh, some some ideas about um, a bar uh, mixed in with sound, um, taking on a, a bit of a retro feel and keeping it to a very sort of subtle palette, as you can see. So color. Now, all colors have some sort of inherent meanings, um, and these are really great to tap into. So for example, red is pretty you know, strong color. Um, and you wouldn't have that color in a spa, for example. Uh, colors such as blues and, and greens are on the cool side and very calming. Uh, colors like yellow are very uplifting uh, and are much warmer. So it's understanding um, colors and how you might be able to utilize them for effect. So tips, uh, again, which is uh, stick to a limited color palette and choose a distinct color palette that enhances the message. And you're most more likely uh, to end up with a, a, a piece of communication that is more recognizable if you stick to some select colors. Now this infographic um, is about weapons. Um, and as you can see, these colors uh, that have been chosen help to convey this message. Um, black is very harsh. Um, the yellow is very jarring color. And, and the gray as well. So in combination, uh, this sort of delivers a very sort of harsh message and supports the communication of this piece. Now this example um, is a green report. 
And as you can see, the colours uh, are very muted, very natural, uh, with the beiges and um, variations of green. This one is for the Cancer Council, and the title of this is Hope. And so they've used this yellow um, because it's a very um, joyful, sunny colour. Um, and when we're using uh, warm colours, it's, it's nice to sort of break them up with some um, cool colours, which is such as blue. Uh, this is just another example of a more interactive uh, infographic and, and data visualisation in 3D form for the Australian Securities Exchange, um, which is kept in very simple colour palette of black and white for effect. And colour can also be used uh, to help sort of navigate information as well. So, for example, using it to colour key. So now tone of voice is really about uh, the voice that you use. And there's many different kinds of voices that we can speak to someone in. And they range from things like a casual voice like, hey, whoa, you know, Sam over there, come and see this. Um, we can have a very Australian voice, uh, a friendly voice, a human voice, a humorous voice, um, conversational. And I thought I'd use the, our Australia's two major telcos um, to show this. As you can see, Optus on the right, um, their language um, is very useful. So tired of watching videos like this, suffering from the buffering room. And Telstra, um, I happen to know, um, has gone with a, a sort of human kind of voice. So um, putting you at the center of everything we do every day. And as you can see that all these components that we've just talked about um, add to the message that's being conveyed. Um, so, anyone, can anyone just sort of um, yell out some, some sort of words that they think that this conveys? Optus. So, for example, youthful. Telstra, which is fast. Um, you can see with the rays that helps to communicate that message. Um, it also uh, feels more credible. Uh, and uh, Optus obviously looks like it aims at a, a more youthful audience. And you can see that the font that's chosen also um, supports these sort of main values and, and the message. So space. Now space is uh, very important in design. Um, just as when we, we talk, we like to have pauses um, and we, when we speak to someone, we like to have some space around us. So it's very important to frame um, your design with some space to allow it to breathe. And this is a, a really good example of this, uh, a poster shot down. And as you can see that it's because of the, the empty space in this poster that makes this uh, poster so powerful and allows you to focus on, on the, the various messages. OK, so I thought I'd just uh, end with an example. And um, this is actually a bad example. And I wanted to ask you, with everything that we've sort of just gone through, what makes this a bad example? Can anyone tell me? Too many colours, yeah, great. Sorry, what was that? Is visually like overpowering because you're taking so many different things in. Yep. Anyone else? Yep. There's no hierarchy to the voice Yep, great. Anything else? That's right. So no grid, very unstructured. Um, you're not sure what's the key message. Yep, 
That's right, no key message. We're very confused, like there's a million messages out here. Anyone else? Okay, so great. Um, so just to summarize, find the key message, tell a compelling story, keep it simple, be consistent, and make it human. Um, these are a few little resources. Uh, Visually is a, a website that is the world's largest community of infographics and data visualization, which you can just go and browse. And this other site down here um, offers some sort of free um, tools um, that you can use as a starting base for um, your images. I like this quote here by Steve Jobs. Creative Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious to them for after a while. Um, and this is really about looking at things holistically. And according to a recent IBM survey of chief executives around the world, creativity is the most sought after trait in leaders today. No one can deny that creative thinking has enabled the rise and continued success of countless companies from startups from Facebook and Google to stalwarts like Procter and Gamble and General Electric. And this is uh, by Tom Kelly and David Kelly of IDEO. Um, and they've written a book called Creative Confidence. So if anyone wants to investigate that a bit more and develop their creative confidence, um, go and find this book. And, and so this is a quote by me. There is no right or wrong in design as there is with maths. Some solutions work better than others and there are many solutions to a problem. So thank you. That's it for today. So any questions?